Viraj Joshi, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, how would you read into last five days of price action? Indian markets are up for the sixth day on the trot. Morning, Nikunj. I think uh, from a short-term perspective, uh, we will be uh, governed by what the global queues are going through. And clearly, I think uh, the riskier trade is on at the moment, uh, specifically when equities are involved. So clearly, I think when you're looking at uh, how the job dates are in the U.S. markets have panned out, uh, uh, that is again giving some signs of hope that the U.S. Fed hike might not happen possibly this year. But again, I think it raises question marks uh, on whether global growth is really on the right track. Uh, and though we speak a lot about China, I think there is a huge amount of uncertainty as far as the key macro data points in China are concerned. Domestically, again, Nikunj, I think uh, from a short-term perspective, I think what really happens with Bihar, elections and a positive outcome thereof uh, might be mm -hmm. trigger points for the markets. But for a structural reelecting, again, I think we've been hopping on this point time and again that corporate earnings need to revive. Mm -hmm. Whether that happens uh, from Q3, Q4, because at large extent is already factoring in that Q2 would be a little bit sluggish as far as uh, the top line for most companies are concerned. It is just related to how soon the recovery probably might happen, both in terms of earnings recovery as well as the KPEX recovery in India. So largely, I think uh, we, we are uh, getting governed by how global markets are moving at this point of time. But clearly, I think our opinion still suggests uh, that the market still stuck uh, in a range. The range might just move 100, 200 points uh, from the 8,200 mark on the higher side for the Nifty. But clearly, I think one needs to look at all these data points in consortium to take a structural view of the markets from medium to long-term perspective. Mayuresh, we were talking about some stocks in news this morning. Uh, I think a prime one will be DLF. Uh, what, what are the thoughts there? Because there is a possibility of some announcement coming in, but the larger story of the real estate bounce is also there, and DLF is, well, arguably the largest player in India as well. What, are the, what, are the, what is the call on DLF? Morning, uh, Neeraj. So clearly, I think uh, if, if one looks at uh, DLF's uh, balance sheet and the numbers that have been stacking up so far, I think it uh, does not give a very encouraging picture. And again, it's a well-laid-out story, I think. High levels of debt on its book causing extreme stress on the bottom lines uh, because of the interest payments. Uh, second, I think the pre-sales, I think you're not really sure in terms of how supply is panning out uh, uh, for, for Noida and uh, the greater Noida region itself. So clearly, I think uh, new launches, uh, the existing inventory are over ranks for the stock. But again, I think clearly, if one looks at uh, the kinds of media articles that one is reading about and the rental assets that DLF is talking about, I think it's a substantial component. I think if you look at the enterprise value, and again, this is from reports that we've been reading through, close to 30,000 or crores and again I think the contribution in terms of any deleveraging happening on that part on the promoter side I think would be a huge sentiment positive for the stock. Structurally and fundamentally I think we'll still wait for numbers to come through on the financial statement because that is what we are more interested in. But yes I think if the news does come through I think uh, hugely sentimental positive for deal. Mayuresh, you know, we've been baffled by the rally in the metals pack in yesterday's session and it was not just India alone, but pretty global a phenomena as well. What is your own sense on whether or not one should put in money into these beaten down cyclicals and are there tremendous gains to be made from here? Morning, Aisha. I think uh, clearly on the uh, metal side of things and on the commodity front, uh, when it comes specifically to metals, both on the ferrous and the non ferrous side, I think it's a double whammy of sorts uh, so far that is getting played out. A, I think in terms of demand supply dynamics, uh, you're probably seeing demand not catching up and uh, supply constraints, uh, again, uh, with, with uh, utilization levels uh, staying low. I think a lot of plants uh, having uh, shut down specifically in China and worldwide as well. I think you're seeing realizations drop, which is not very encouraging sign for a lot of these uh, commodity players. Secondly, I think the fall in input costs uh, would provide some amount of respite to a lot of these commodity players. But again, I think does it actually offset the kind of fall that one really sees in realizations and the volume degrowth thereof. So clearly, I think it's uh, one end of the story that you're looking at. The other end of the story, again, is uh, a lot of reports that we are probably hearing in terms of uh, import uh, duties and withholding taxes and so on and so forth. So I think if that probably comes through, I think it becomes a safeguard mechanism uh, for a lot of these Indian players. But again, I think you look at the Indian companies specifically, I think, and they're going to get hit on both these counts. I think volume degrowth is uh, a predominant feature that might play out over the next couple of quarters, to say the least. High cost iron ore inventory, I think, is going to play torrent on balance sheets of most of these companies. And again, I think, as I'm saying, fall in realization. So something like a Tata Steel, I think, you're seeing positive reports come through with pension liability 
it is expected to come through. But Tata Steel Europe's EBITDA per ton is going to take a hit. Again, clearly, I think subdued activity in the South Asian regions domestically, again, 1.5 MTPA of high iron ore inventory is going to take a toll. So I think I don't mind missing a rally even if it comes through on these counters. But again, I think I'll structurally wait for cash flows to improve, which we do not foresee at least for Q2, Q3. Okay, Mahirish, stay on. So much more to speak about. Let's take a very, very quick break uh, on that note. We come back, uh, get you some more technical ideas from, tech, from experts. Also get you the top brokerage views this morning. The middle path turning absolutely flat right now in trade. 81.97, so just about nudging the 80-200 border, which for the spot nifty continues to be a very tough resistance to zone. In the near term, of course, the trajectory seems to be on the upside for our markets. But let's get in some more trading ideas. Mitish, what's on your list right now? So I have a buy on steel authority from the metals pack. It's given a minor breakout from the uh, 54 to about 50 rupee range consolidation, which the stock was doing for about two and a half weeks. Now can be bought with a stop at 53 for targets of 59. And my second call is a buy on TVS Motors. It's given a price and volume breakout yesterday. So I would look at any kind of 1% uh, kind of a decline on intraday basis. So buy around 239, keep a stop at 233 and look at targets of around 255. Over. Ashwini, uh, your stocks and uh, an interesting uh, call is uh, uh, Shrey Infra. Why do you like this one? Well, because uh, everything two-digit was moving up yesterday. So Shrey Infra had a 7-8% type of move. Uh, this can be bought with a stop, say, around 44 and uh, look for targets of 56. I want to pick up TBS Motors and uh, TBS Motors could be important. TVS Motors uh, and that uh, BMW joint venture now could see the launch of their first bike. Bear in mind that iShare so far has really enjoyed what could be called as virtual monopoly in the life cycle to wheeler market. So there is no competition for oil, oil uh, in field. Harley Davidson is there, but Harley Davidson is is uh, still available at about four and a half to five lakh rupees. That's the ex showroom price. The BMW pricing could be much more softer than Harley Davidson. It could be higher than Royal Enfield. So the, the so the whole point, talking point, I guess, is that so far Royal Enfield has enjoyed an enviable position. No competition whatsoever. Harley Davidson and Triumph they are not in that league. Can BMW be disruptive for Aisha Motors? Um, no, BMW is going to be a way way more expensive bike. Uh, I mean, than no, Aisha. No, the Bose base model of Aisha, yes, it will be cheaper than the BMW bike, but otherwise the higher models of Aisha, 5 lakhs, 6 lakhs, I believe TVS bikes could be in that range. But I, I'm just saying, I'm not a perfect bike enthusiast, but I think the two, uh, two vehicles are just chalk and cheese, so to say, right? I mean, a lot of history for Harley Davidson and Enfe. And, and, and that the nature of that bike is quite separate. I mean, I don't know how the bike will turn yeah, out, but I was looking at the chic, uh, yeah, is, is I was looking at the comparison. prototype yesterday, and assuming that is the model, it's it's got a more sporty feel to it as opposed to that Aisha, which is that uh, as as Sturdy, one of the fund managers beastie. are saying, me everybody wants to buy the but 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 but. Yeah. So <laughs> maybe it's just a separate two different kettles of fish. But I'm not a bike enthusiast, self confessed. No, all I'm here. saying is that. Royal Enfield so far has not seen any competition whatsoever. That became the default choice. If you wanted to buy a, an expensive, an expensive okay. bike, a lifestyle two-wheeler, uh, two-wheeler, that was the default choice. Options are there now. Harley Davidson also, my understanding is that soon they would be coming out with an Indian launch, Indian version where the price could be more affordable. I sure still will enjoy the, the, the a commanding position because that's the only one available. Mm. But is there a disruption which could happen? In the high bracket. It could well be the Maruti, you know, where nothing will disturb them. Yeah. But just a point. Well, Mayuresh, uh, I don't know if you're a bike enthusiast, uh, but uh, what's the call? TVS. Uh, it's finally coming in from their stable as a bike from TVS, which could be an envi enviable buy. So again, uh, Neeraj, more or less in cars, but uh, again, uh, tracking the bike market, uh, uh, clearly, yes, I think if the bike launch does come through, I think what really needs to understand, uh, A, as uh, Nikunj was pointing out, what kind of pricing will come through. And again, I think it will take some length of time before they establish uh, a decent market share, create royalty for themselves in terms of uh, uh, how their brand will get positioned. So I think uh, Royal Enfield, uh, to that extent, will still keep on enjoying uh, 
market leadership position uh, across this range of bikes. Uh, they're also planning to introduce a couple of more bikes over the next few quarters. Their overseas markets is some big segment that they are targeting, so adding on 800 dealers. And basically, Neeraj, again, I think the consumption for all these bikes is semi-urban urban, so I think it's more urban-led story on the kind of bikes and pricing that is probably expected to come through. For TBS particularly, I think the proportion, uh, one really needs to understand how it will increase in what uh, extent and what the management focus is. But as on date, I think, uh, as we've seen the numbers come through, I think because of low proportion of mopeds, uh, which obviously entail higher margins for TBS, I think that has seen some amount of drop. So the product mix uh, has basically ensured that the EBITDA margins of TBS are not expanding at the pace uh, that one really expects. And again, interest payments are causing a toll on the bottom line. So again, yes, sentimentally positive, but again, it will take some length of time. So till that point of time, I think we still uh, believe Royal Enfield, uh, Aisha Motors will command and uh, gain market leadership position. And clearly, I think even on the MHCV side of the business, it's doing pretty well. So I think we remain extremely bullish uh, as on date on uh, Aisha Motors. Mm. Okay, let's also analyze what's happening in the currency market, considering it was a six-week high for the rupee yesterday, which managed to nudge the 65 mark. Manisha joins in with some more perspective. Manisha? Thank you so much for that, Aisha. Well, we hit an eight-week highs on the currency yesterday, more than 6-10% of a gains coming in, and it has been nearly 2% of a jump up in last seven trading sessions for the currency. Having said that, it's the weak U.S. economic data, which has turned for encouragement for most of the Asian currencies. If you look at an Indonesian rupiah or a Malaysian ringgit, they have gained nearly 5 to 7% from the kind of flows that we saw in the recent days there. The FI inflows have been encouraging and that would continue to support the rupee on the higher side. One major data event is out of the way. The Bank of Japan has kept the policy unchanged, keeps the QE at around 80 trillion Japanese yen and says that the economy is on the recovery stage there. But what you would want to watch today is the FMC, FOMC meeting minutes and that would tell you on whether or not the FOMC actually has been able to come to a timeline on an interest rate hike. Having said that, the bond markets also have been steady consolidating, expected to be in a range today as well. And you also have seen the domestic liquidity conditions continuing easy as well. Okay, Manisha, many thanks for that. Uh, for That's the macros to watch out for. But remember, we we're talking about pharma all through the last few days, a bunch of names hitting new highs. Lupin is one of, once amongst those, which is actually hitting new highs almost every single day. So a good bounce back. Yesterday, what a bit of a day of consolidation, but UBS has come out with an interesting note. They raised the target to 2510. Pranay Johnson with that note. Pranay. Yes, Neeraj. Uh, day before yesterday, it crossed 2100, hitting a new life high. And while it is nearing the target price of most analysts, UBS uh, has raised its uh, target price further by about 20% to 2510, as you pointed out, while maintaining its buy call. In fact, it is... It is its top pick in the pharma sector and it sees the earnings doubling over the next three years. How is this going to happen? Basically, it's hoping on the pickup in launches from US, which contributes about 45% of the overall business. They expect this to be about 50% uh, 50 of overall contribution in FI17. Also, it has uh, seen a low base in US because it has remained in a range. So the pickup is going to be tremendous from that low base. And also the acquisition of Gavis is something where it is particularly positive on because Ever since the announcement of the acquisition three months back, uh, Gavis has already received eight product approvals and has added significantly to Lupin's own pipeline. So the combined product approvals are expected to be about 25 uh, plus each year starting this year. And over the next six months, there could be launches such as Azithromycin, Glumetsa, Nexium, Renvela, Wellcall. Uh, amongst many others. In fact, the price hike that we've seen for the generics of Glumetsa and uh, Fortimate is something which is going to benefit the company even in the near term. So it expects the US business, which is the biggest market, to contribute uh, to grow at a pace of 25% on a compounded basis for the next three years. EBITDA margins for Gavis will expand and valuations, though not cheap at 27 times, will be sustainable because of the high return ratios. Well, not surprised that people are turning bullish on Lupin once again. A bit of a scare mid, mid through the year, but now again bullish notes coming in. Thanks for that, Pranay. Thanks for joining in. Now, Mayuresh, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, we've discussed Lupin at length with, over the last few days. What I want from you is, what is it that you're advising clients to do right now? And I want, uh, you know, one or two ideas. Typically, when I ask you this, you give our viewers a bunch of five or six ideas. I want one large mid-cap recommendation that angel broking as a house is giving out to its clients right now. 
So clearly, anyway, out of the pharma space, uh, Orbindo Pharma is still something that we are liking and very, very optimistic about. Uh, the acquisitions that uh, Orbindo has done, and that's basically the underlying theme uh, uh, that we are liking, Activist and Natural, uh, which has ensured that uh, Orbindo has become an 80% uh, uh, dominated formulations driven top line uh, pharma company. I think it's a high margin business. And again, I think if you look at uh, the various components uh, within all its business lines, uh, clearly I think uh, the formulation business is something that uh, we are very, very hopeful about. Uh, the injectables business uh, is another key trigger for the stock. So the management is very, very hopeful of having some 18, 20 approvals come through over the next two years. Again, it's a very high margin business. Uh, Orbind also maintains a very high market leadership positions in the anti-retroviral segment. So the ARV segment is pretty large and huge. Again, entailing huge margins for the company. In terms of the NDA pipeline, a very, very strong pipeline here. 379 are drugs in the pipeline. 201 approved so far, so there's a huge pending approval list uh, expected to come through for our window. And our own take is over the next two years, the 12% uh, earnings CAGR, uh, taking the company's top line probably at 11,700, 11,800 odd mark. And valuations again not looking very, very steep. So I think our window remains one of our top picks uh, within the pharma sector. Right, I'm in minute 50. The big story, of course, is China. If you've just tuned in, uh, Chinese markets are up by more than 3%, but China was shut for about a week. So that 3% should not be looked in isolation. 3% is largely Chinese markets are reacting and adjusting to how global markets have moved. And frankly, global markets have been in a, in a good patch, so to speak. It's not just equities. Commodities, beaten down groups, beaten down currencies, uh, beaten down metal stocks. Everything which was oversold, you know, uh, where price disruption or the, the selling was slightly disorderly, those groups are making a uh, comeback. A case in point here is how Tata Motors in the last three days has registered double-digit gains. Hindalco in this month itself has made a comeback of about 10% plus. So the story clearly is that beaten down and oversold groups have made a comeback. Beaten down markets are the first ones to bounce back. What has fallen the most is the first one to come back. Hiraj? Well, yes, uh, so do watch out. We've been highlighting this fact. The Hindalcos and the JSPLs of the world have essentially been the big gainers. Let's see if that continues. Interestingly, a couple of auto names featured out there as well. But I want to talk about today's stocks in news. And do watch out for two or three names. I'll start off with a mid-cap name, uh, HCL Info. Derive Investments, uh, Radha Krishna Damani Company, and we'll actually tell you about some of the holdings of uh, the marquee investor in a bit, was up 20% yesterday. Could be a very interesting play in today's session as, them, as well because of the name involved. So do watch out for HCL Info. Do watch out for Sipla as well. There, there are a couple of uh, buzzwords on the street as well. There's an announcement uh, that could well come in very, very soon. So do watch out for Sipla. Has had a good move yesterday. Could well continue in today's session. Tata Steel could have a bit of a reaction as well. So do watch out for that other stock. And of course, the big one is DLF. We've been telling our viewers for the last three days that there could be a possible announcement in DLF. Real estate is not a, not a bad spot right now to trade or invest in. So do watch out for this one as well. But here come the first trades uh, and expect a bit of a flattish start. The sub 8200 is where the consensus on the street is with regards to trade this morning. So we opened about 8214, maybe just to correct a bit. Sensex slightly northwards uh, of 27,000, about 27,017. So yeah, it's a mixed bag right now. Bring up Tata Steel, bring up Sipla, uh, bring up uh, the commodity names, the Vedantas, Hindalcos of the world, they've done very well. Bring up Ken, and of course bring up HCL Info and just see if that one is also moving in trade today or no. The commodity names are perched well. HCL Info, not a surprise really. Uh, showing a 10% uptick, maybe this will change. But it will be, I believe it will be safe to presume that SCL Info could well start with a big bout of green in today's session as well. It sure has, 10% higher in the pre-open rates. The currency too maintains uh, its level of about 65. Remember, uh, yesterday you saw an eight-week high for the rupee. Today you're seeing just very marginal losses really coming in. 65.08 is where the rupee has kick-started trade. I want to revisit what technology is up to, considering that was the laggard pack and it, uh, you know, uh, 
it takes more significance considering come 12th of October next week you're going to be having increased numbers. More importantly, after what HCL technology is guided by way of a profit warning, um, IT has not really been having the best session. But I want to revisit some of the metal names from yesterday, the likes of Hindalco, Vedanta, Tata Steel. These were big movers today too, just marginally in the green. But yes, the momentum continues. And yes, the upstream oil and gas majors, ONGC, Ken, with that rebound in crude prices, um, these saw a bit of a rub off. And today, too, Ken is higher by about half a percent. A nice move coming in for ONGC, one and a quarter percent up in the green. But Ajay, what is the dealing room charter this morning? Good morning, Aisha. Aisha, uh, very uh, positive kind of a setup uh, looking like on the markets and traders are looking forward for longs. Uh, so first stock to watch out for is Sipla. Now Sipla is a stock last two days is witnessing not only delivery based buying but fresh long positions being added. Last evening they've done a, uh, you know, a tie up for, uh, with the Algerian company for respiratory drug. But over and above that, uh, you know, experts and analysts on the street are expecting a big uh, inhaler launch in uh, UK, which is a large market for them, the Adaware drug. It's a, you know, high margin, large drug for Cipla. And that uh, launch is also expected very shortly. So around that, the trading positions are towards the long side. So watch out for Cipla. Last two days also, some good institutional action is witnessed there. Apart from that, yesterday was the first day of the big move in upstream companies. Cane India is one stock to watch out for in the near term. It may correct a little bit because the petroleum report had witnessed some cutting of crude inventories. But on falls, this is one stock to watch out for in the near term because a lot of large global hedge funds are cutting their short positions in crude. So there are chances of higher up moves. Last one is ICICI Bank. Uh, well, the JP Group's 75% of the debt has come under default category. So this is one stock which may come under pressure today. Okay, many thanks for that, Ajay. Now to something that uh, is, is an initiative of ET Now Research and try and get you interesting, uh, uh, interesting ideas. So remember, we were last, or this week rather, earlier in the week, we started off something called Bulls versus Bears. We tried and give you both sides of the argument for a particular stock, and Tata Motors was that one. What we are trying to do now is try and tell viewers and investors about why there shouldn't be any kind of phobia for a stock which is in a four-digit or a five-digit uh, category. A higher price need not be an, mean that it is an expensive stock. And that's what I think Darshan is trying to bring with this piece of research. Darshan, a high price stock need not necessarily mean that it is expensive. What is on the agenda today? What is the stock that we are talking See, about? Today we are talking about Natco. But I just wanted to say, first of all, that this is only for information and knowledge purpose. We are not recommending or this should not Perfect. be taken as, as, you know, a recommendation that we are saying. We are just saying that some of the stocks are very high priced. That does not mean you have to look at other factors irrespective of the run-up or the P multiple to choose a stock. Now, today we are talking about a company called Natco Pharma. The price is almost 2500 It has run up significantly from over the last year. It was almost 300 and 400 It's almost 2400 so what we are saying and the big question for Natco Pharma today is that you have, can the market cap go up for the company? The market cap currently is just 8,700 crores compared to the lakhs of crores that, you know, a Lupin has or a Sun Pharma has. So probably does Natco have the potential to be that? Now, you have to ask yourself what will drive earnings for Natco Pharma? First of all, the US pipeline is extremely robust for the company. It has almost 12 para fours with nine of them first to file, which is a big opportunity. And in 1617, another 14 new filings will come in. So that is a huge, huge uh, opportunity. The Sovaldi launch is doing extremely well. So despite US being muted for the next one or two years, Sovaldi will launch, uh, you know, will be extremely positive. And as far as the R&D is concerned, extremely strong R&D pipeline. Uh, they are able to come out with complex products on a low price, uh, low R&D cost because they are able to get in partners for these. Now, what is the play as far as... Uh, uh, Natco is concerned. First of all, Copaxon was a disappointment, but still there is value there. Uh, a slew of launches, you know, Tamiflu is there, Vidaza is there. A lot of drugs are there which will actually uh, boost the Natco Pharma's, uh, you know, uh, potential going ahead. And, and, you know, it has found a lot of marketing partners. Because of that, they are able to go uh, big on complex drugs at a very, very low R&D cost. Right. <clears throat> You know, but, so, yeah, yeah that's the bottom. I mean, the whole point is it's such a curious stock. It's a stock which has got a market capitalization of 8,900 crore, extremely rich P multiples.
but the future pipeline is looking interesting. Should we remind our viewers that this is the same company which actually challenged Novartis in Glevec? Yeah, that is right. And you, and you know, one of the important factors you have to watch out for is that Dilip Sangvi is an investor. He bought shares at almost uh, 300 rupees and look where the stock is now. In terms of the pipeline, just look at these, com th th these uh, opportunities. Tamiflu, it's a $600 million mm -hmm. opportunity. Rim Levit, that will come out in FY17-18. It's a $3.5 billion drug. You have Copoxone, which is a $2 billion drug. You have another $1 billion drug. So they have a pipeline of drugs that is there. And in terms of just look at the financials, what is there. Now, as far as financials are concerned, look at what happened at the end of FY15. The sales were 774 crores and the margins were at 24%. And uh, the EPS was at almost uh, 41 rupees. Now, what are analysts estimating? The management has given the commentary that sales growth will be 30% in this year and 20% profit. But look at FY17. That's the big trigger. Credit Suisse, most of them believe that it will be a 1600 to 1700 crore top line with margins of anywhere around 35%. So that's a huge jump. And because of this, the P that is at 50 times right now will fall down to 16 times in FY17. So now you have to ask yourself, is that P, is the P really high on an FY17 basis? And can the market cap go up beyond 8700? So course, that is the big question. Of course, this is not a recommendation. Darshan, fantastic analysis. Thank you for that uh, you know, lovely analysis on Natco Pharma. The bottom line here is that we are trying to simply put the dots together for our viewers so that they can benefit from eating hours of research teams and sites. Natco Pharma on paper for the moment is expensive, but they've got a wonderful pipeline, brilliant R&D, brilliant processes, endorsement from marquee investors. So what may look expensive today in FI17, FI18, markets always look forward. It may not be such an expensive stock. Now, Yatin is also getting ready. And we're also going to bring, on, uh, you know, bring our viewers up to speed with how smart money is moving. What are some of the marquee market, uh, market investors doing? And yesterday's bulk data is indicating that derived investment, which is owned by none other than the market, uh, the uh, you know prominent investor, Radha Krishnan Damani, has been shopping. So, Yatin, first details of that block, block deal and what else has been this firm shopping? Well, uh, Neeraj, as you are mentioning, uh, the owner of DMART, uh, Radha Krishnan Damani, he is a very marquee investor and a trader in the market. Uh, even uh, investors like Lakesh Junjunwala consider him as a guru and a super trader. And clearly, he, his uh, money focus has been in quality stocks. If you look at the performance also of his portfolio, that has been rock solid. Uh, in fact, let me take you to the recent bulk deals uh, wherein his uh, holdings and uh, trades have been uh, reported. Uh, yesterday, we had HCL Info Systems wherein uh, Radha Kishan Damani has bought nearly 12 lakh shares from the open market. Uh, yesterday, if you look at the stock price momentum also, the stock uh, gained over 20% in trade. Today also, it's up by nearly 7-8% in the pre-open. So that is the kind of impact that these marquee investors create. Apart from that, uh, Snowman Logistics, Balaji Tele, uh, India Cements, uh, these are the recently reported uh, bulk deals wherein Radha Kishan Damani has grabbed a significant amount of chunk when it comes to Balaji Tele and Snowman Logistics. Over uh, you know 25 to 30 lakh shares is what he bought. India Cements also 21 lakh shares is what was reported in the bulk deal. As far as his uh, you know, marquee portfolio is concerned, we tried to find out the basic, uh, basic uh, holding uh, structure of his. Uh, in TV today, he holds close to 6% uh, transport corporation. And it's, it's, a, it's a known phenomenon uh, that uh, RK Damani has been known for his investment in logistic stocks. So TCI, Gati and Blue Dart wherein he holds, uh, you know, nearly 5 to 6 percent. They have been doing really uh, well. In fact, if you look at the last few year returns, you know, 30 to 40 percent is the compounded return uh, is what the stocks have been giving up. So clearly, uh, now the new stock in focus is HCL Infosystem, where a turnaround is expected by the market participants. Well, big guys have been shopping, which is very important. And the big man himself, I, if I look at his current uh, portfolio composition, extremely diversified, no large concentration, from Balaji to an India cement to an HCL Infosys, there is, well, there is no connection whatsoever. But I think the belief generally is that bet on companies which will gain because of consumption because of, uh, and because of the economy comes back. So I think that seems to be the broad construct of the portfolio. Yuresh, give me, your, give me a high risk, high return mid cap idea where the downside could be 20%, volatility could be 15, 17%. But you expect if things go well. The upside could be 25 to 30 percent in the next six months. So clearly, Nikonj, I think uh, something that you're liking is uh, a stock called uh, CRM Silk Milk. And if it does correct, uh, 
further from the current levels, I think it becomes a, a very good uh, investment opportunity. If you're looking at the business segments, uh, blended fabrics accounts for nearly 75% of its overall top line. Garments take care of the next uh, 18%. Uh, the debt equity on the balance sheet is close to 0.6. Uh, the management is hopeful of getting that down to 0.4. And our own take is with improving cash flow, specifically in terms of how volume growth will pan out on the shirting side of business when it comes to the garment side. And clearly, I think blended fabrics are doing well. Our own take is that the return on equity should improve to 20.5%. The return on investment capital, which is currently languishing around 17.5%, should improve to 20.2%, 20 20.3%. Having said that, I think with improving cash flows, our own take is that the dividend payout should increase ideally over the next two years from 10 rupees to 15 rupees. And in terms of valuations that are on eight and a half times currently, I think it uh, becomes a very, very attractive bet. So I think if it corrects further from the current levels, it becomes extremely attractive. And yes, I think a 25-30% return over the next 12 months is not ruled out. Mayuresh, good having you as always. Thanks so much for taking the time out and being with us this morning and giving us your Thank thoughts you and recommendations. So well, some interesting ideas as well from Angel Broking's side, but some interesting pieces of research.